It's been well known since their launch that Kaby Lake CPUs have been pretty fantastic for overclocking. In fact, back in January, I released a video showing just how easy these chips were to get to 5 GHz by having my 5-year-old son set the multiplier in the BIOS on the ASUS Maximus 9 formula. 5 GHz on air was not uncommon for many people using these K-series processors. But KB Lake's time is drawing to a close. There's a replacement coming up over the horizon, and it's just about to go the way of forced obsolescence in about under two weeks. Thankfully, ASUS South Africa didn't want to just let these CPUs fade away into the sunset, but rather they wanted them to go out with a bang or freeze, I suppose. You see, ASUS has in its product lineup what's considered to be the best motherboard for extreme overclockers, the Z270 Maximus 9 Apex. And instead of wasting their money by sending one of those motherboards for me to review, since I know crap all about overclocking with liquid nitrogen, they decided to invite myself and a few other dashing young gentlemen to a masterclass on how to do extreme overclocking properly so we could hit some insanely high clock speeds under parental supervision of none other than Dr. Wheeze, one of South Africa's top overclockers. Even if you're not in South Africa, his name might sound familiar to you since last year, he was one of the first people to hit three gigahertz on a GTX 1060 during an overclocking carnival. I was told that he still has that specific golden GPU in his possession. But we're here for CPU overclocking today, not GPU. So let's get into cranking up those voltages, plummeting those tents and melting the CPU with insanely high frequencies. Whoa, hold on there, buckaroo. We're dealing with some seriously dangerous stuff here. While throwing liquid nitrogen into a pot might look as simple as pouring some milk into your cereal, it requires preparation, caution, and a healthy dose of realizing that you're dealing with temperatures that are easily below 190 degrees Celsius and can cause a nasty case of isolated frostbite if you're not giving the LN2 its proper respect. Let's have the master, Dr. Weiss, tell us himself. If you just touch it, not dangerous, all right? So if it just touches you, not dangerous. When you actually put it in your hand and cup it, dangerous. Okay, so prolonged experience, putting your fingers into it, prolonged experience, you will get frostbite and you can lose um, parts of your body. Okay, so not only did we need to be mentally prepared for dealing with the bitter cold of liquid nitrogen, the boards and CPUs have to be prepared as well. The biggest challenge when dealing with freezing temps on any PC is the potential buildup of condensation. Ice begins to form around the liquid nitrogen area and then can melt into water during the process and all of us should know that water plus PC parts equals a dead system. So to try to prevent this buildup on the system itself, we coated the boards in Vaseline so that any condensation that does happen simply stays above the PCB on the layer of Vaseline and can slide right off. Also, we have to be careful to cover any of the PCI Express slots that we won't be using since you can't put Vaseline in the slots as it'll just ruin the contacts. So just some painter's tape to cover it up and the board is good to go. Next, we have to de-lid the 7700Ks. Unfortunately, Intel has continuously decided to cheapen out on the thermal interface material between the die and the heat spreader, so adding extra paste in between this layer helps us to have better thermal conductivity and dissipate the extra heat from the higher voltages more effectively. Then it was time to drop the CPU into the socket, although not really dropping, just placing it in gently and then using the included CPU installation tool that comes with the Maximus 9 Apex to help us keep the bottom half of the chip in place while we secure the heat spreader back on the top and then lock it down with the retention arm of the socket. Now conventional wisdom says that a little's enough here, but Dr. Weiss told us to slather it on there to help prevent any cracking between the PCB and the lid of the chip. The extra thermal goop allows for a much tighter suction under these extreme circumstances. The key for liquid nitrogen now, and this is not what you do for air cooling. For air cooling, you just need to put a single, a single line yep. down the middle. But for liquid nitrogen, what we actually need to do is we need to create a suction between the die and the top of the lid. So in order to create the suction, we actually need to put thermal paste around a much larger area. So that is way too much for air cooling, but it's just about right for liquid nitrogen. After that, it was time to prepare the actual copper pots that go on top of the CPUs that allow us to contain the liquid nitrogen and drop the temps on these processors. These things were incredibly beefy, coming in at over four kilograms each. So getting an even spread of more thermal paste on the top of the CPU was necessary and then creating a good even seal with the mounting mechanism to make sure everything's tightened properly so that the copper pot is dissipating all of the heat that's coming off of the 7700K. The sheer mass of these pots allowed them to keep the CPUs at ambient temperatures even with no coolant in them. But we needed a quick overview of how this process actually works before getting to the pouring session, so Dr. Weiss gave us a quick run through of the features that we could utilize on the Apex and how to get the best scores and frequencies possible. 
The other function that you can use, we won't actually use today, is a slow mode and a pause button. So essentially what slow mode does, it <coughs> reduces the number of cores that the processor uses um, and also reduces the, the megahertz speed. Actually, don't do the cores on this version. It just reduces the megahertz. So if you've got a clock to 6G and it's crashing when it finishes a benchmark, what you can do is you, you can put slow mode on to take the screenshot to actually record your, your score. The other nice thing that you can do with the, with the ROG um, boards is the pause button. Essentially what it does, it can put your whole PC into a frozen state. <coughs> it's paused, everything. So it literally just locks it on that. Locks it up. Okay, but <laughs> it doesn't block it so that you have to reboot. You can just you can unpause it and no, continue cool. like normal. And where this is an advantage, if you're running a benchmark like you're going to run today, a Cinebench, it puts immense amounts of load onto the processor. and Overclocking essentially is thermo uh, uh, cycling through the temperature. So when it's under load, you need to pour more nitrogen in order to keep the temperature where it's operating. If it gets too hot, it's going to crash. So you can now use the pause button to pause everything, cool everything back down again to minus 190, okay. unpause it, yeah. pause it, cool, pour, you know, and you can actually you can do a dance like that. And you're wanting to pull air away from the motherboard. So when we start pouring the liquid nitrogen you want the vapor and you'll see it shortly to actually come away from the board. You don't want it to settle down onto the board. It causes extra cold and condensation. So now what we want to do is we want to just put a little bit of nitrogen in. Okay. And we want to watch the, the temperature as she starts to drop. And we want to make sure that it's dropping at a similar rates on both of them. So I'm confident that your mount, as the temperature is dropping here, it's also dropping. It's dropping there. Yeah. Which means you've got a you got a very good mount, and you can see it down. It dropped almost two degrees straight away so as that cold is filtering down. This temperature drops quickly. But you should be able to see it quite quickly. It should start reacting, and then it just slowly catch up. Now yours is a much faster one, so you'll notice this temperature will drop much quicker, and then eventually that will now start to drop and catch up. It's not distant. But he has a faster pot? Much faster pot. He's got the fastest pot here. Okay. Now comes the process of getting the CPU down to the correct temperatures to begin jacking up the voltages because with voltage comes heat and in order to dissipate that heat, you need something to dissipate it into, which is where the LN2 comes into play. Now a quick side note before we get into the actual overclocking tidbits. All of the CPUs that were provided for us to use had already been tested by Dr. Weiss himself. And unfortunately, the crowd's consensus was that I had to take the worst performing chip out of the bunch to hopefully even the playing field, while GMAX took the highest bin one. George, what do you feel about your odds of winning this? Uh, I feel very confident. I think this is, uh, this is the recommended chip. I'm going to the top. Yeah. So, You're welcome my, that I left my... it over for you. <laughs> I mean, we're only talking about the difference between 6.5 and 6.6 .6 gigahertz, but still, at these super low temperatures and insanely fast speeds, that little 100 megahertz means the difference between having a rock solid system and a chip that will spite you on every single benchmark. So, on my chip, which Dr. Wee's had rated for 6.5 gigahertz, I managed to hit that frequency at around 1.6, 1.65 volts, which isn't too shabby. Definitely my highest clock speed ever. And that allowed me to reach a Cinebench 15 score of 1,428 points. Disabling two of the cores allowed me to reach 6.7 gigahertz on the 7700K, which was the highest frequency of the day, but I didn't tell anybody about that because I didn't want to make them feel bad. GMAX hit the highest frequency on all four cores, coming in at an intense 6.65 GHz, and Tiny hit the best Cinebench score out of anyone with his 6.6 GHz overclock, managing to pull in a score of 1,456 points, thanks to some cheeky memory overclocking. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. <laughs> On average, each of our LN2 sessions lasted about 45 minutes until the ice started to take over our boards and freeze our RAM and other components. There's ways to prevent that from developing too quickly, but 45 minutes was enough for all of us to get clock speeds that were over 6.5 gigahertz and get a taste of what it's like to live on the extreme. Once our systems were no longer stable, it was time to blowtorch the copper pots up to our normal temperatures so that we could take apart the system and get everything put away for the next ASUS Overclocking Masterclass workshop. <laughs> now, the, the reason why it's important to always look at this is because it tells you, it gives you an indication of what you need to work on the next time you do it. So again, really, really decent mount. You had a small spot here, so we might have just have been a little bit uneven on the tightening. Okay. Now that could have taken all 50 megahertz. Okay. You know, so wow. again, really good mount. You don't have any really dark, dark mount lines. And when you pull it away, you can, you can see the, the, the evenness of that, that spread. 
It was actually a pretty great experience to be able to enjoy the rush of subjecting computer hardware to extreme conditions to get the absolute best performance out of these parts. It's not practical by any stretch, you're not going to be playing video games at these frequencies or temperatures, but much like drag racing, it provides a fresh, exciting perspective on something that we use in our everyday lives. Knowing that the 7700K that's sitting on my shelf right now is capable of so much more power than I could ever get out of it, makes me even more impressed with how much effort Intel and AMD put into their products. And I'm also even more impressed by those who actually choose to do extreme overclocking competitively, knowing that you're racing not only against a competition clock to get the best scores possible, but that you're sitting on a time bomb of potentially pushing your system too far for too long and having everything end because you're actually reached the brink of what modern process technology can do is just amazing. I mean, it was an experience that can't readily be put into words without sounding trite. I mean, awesome is about as close as I can get because it truly did inspire awe to have the CPUs running at a full two gigahertz over what their standard boost clock is. So yeah. Anyways, I'm going to wrap this video up there. I wanna again say thank you to ASUS South Africa and Dr. Wheeze for holding the workshop. I definitely appreciate it. Let me know down below in the comments if you'd want me to explore more of this extreme overclocking side of things. Dr. Wheeze actually doesn't live too far down the highway for me, so I'm sure we could work something out. Also, be sure to hit that like button to show support for us. Hit that subscribe button down there to stay up to date on all of our tech-related content. I'm Brett with the UF Disciple channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers. You have what you have to get this like angry face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired of you. Yep.